So today is July 10th, uh, 1984, and this is Lamont and Marion and Brooke Wentz, and uh, the time is uh, 1.06 and 26 seconds p.m. We're at 6 Harrison Street. Most of the things that I perform live have become such big productions that it's very hard to get uh, places that can afford to do it. And I have intentionally tried not to just come up with something that uh, fits in the, the plaster cast mold of this one night stand type of thing where you go in and uh, like Phil Glass used to tell me how proud he was of the fact that he could set it up in two hours, it sounded good every time and he could get in and get out of the concert in the same night. I realize the practicality of that and it's not that I just really don't want to do it, but the way I compose and the way I work, I have always followed my intuition and my inspiration. And um, I am totally involved with the well-tuned piano at that time. I'm also composing some new works. I have something that will first go through a computer stage. We have a, uh, a new synthesizer made by David Rayner. And, uh, this synthesizer is good for me because it can work in ratios so that I can continue my work in just intonation and come up with uh, intervals that really nobody has had a chance to hear before. Bob Balecki, whom I work with, has also built for me some custom-made uh, devices that are capable of dialing up intervals of that uh, sort. So. Uh, the problem, the reason I don't do a whole bunch of performances every year unless I do one of my big productions uh, stems from this fact that uh, they are so costly. And uh, for instance, we have done the well-tuned piano um, three times here at Dia since we've been in this building. I did it many series in the past. When I do the well-tuned piano, it usually consists of seven or eight concerts. Each concert is about a week apart because um, I... Did, did you hear some of the Wilton mm -hmm. piano? What did you in, hear the last in concert? In 81, in October of 81. Mm -hmm. uh, probably you heard the five-hour part of the five-hour yeah, five concert. Hour, yeah. right. You mm -hmm. had done them live and, and recorded. Uh, you see, to do this, um, I rehearse and we tune the piano for a month or two before the concerts begin and then I'm performing once a week uh, so I like to do at least seven or eight concerts so that people can see the growth and development of the piece. Each concert is somewhat different, even though the chord changes, let's say, are the same, mm -hmm. even though the thematic material is pretty much the same, I then take this, begin at some place with the opening chord, and it develops and grows, and each performance takes its own mm -hmm. shape and structure. Uh, I might spend two hours in the pool at one performance and only an hour at another performance and more time in the romantic chord. So that um, the pool is it becomes quite an organically alive thing, this performance uh -huh. series. And uh, uh, if I perform on Sundays, I have a tape playback on Wednesdays so that people who want to come and hear the performance again can. And also I get it, then a chance to hear it and think about what I've done and yeah. it influences my next performance. So. Um, in Maybe years where I do the well-tuned piano somewhere, I do about eight performances wherever I do one of these big productions. We right now have an invitation to do something in Stuttgart in 85. Six. Six. Yeah. I really don't think that John Cage needs any introduction. However, I am going to give you a little lowdown, <laughs> I guess one should say. Um, and I'll tell you a little bit about, about the piece called Roratorio, uh, which is an Irish circus on Finnegan's Wake. Um, it is a radio play uh, called Roratorio, an Irish circus on Finnegan's Wake, was awarded the Carl Schuka prize. Right. Is that right? Shuka prize. Uh, for the best composition for 1979, it was felt to represent a convincing example of radio poetry that at the same time pushed forward the frontiers of the medium. It was also presented at the Donoshring Musical Festival, and on making the award, the jury said, Cage opens up an endlessly rich acoustic world, although it is strongly rooted in literary and musical ideas. It is a world made up of sounds, text, and music, one which the listener is able at will to experience and at the same time is exposed to sounds, which the radio, normally restricted to the me meditation of one-dimensional information, cannot normally offer. 
I thought that was a good quote to start out, uh, give an explanation of the piece. Um, now, I know that for a while you've been saying that you've wanted to always see Merce realize it, or when you came up for the festival, the birthday celebration that we did for you, I believe in 82 or 81, it hadn't been realized, I think, at that time by the Cunningham Company. So when did, what year, and, and how did... Um, uh, look, I'm not a good historian. <laughs> But, um, <laughs> well, you're better on your own but pieces. Since, <laughs> since this was an Irish circus, uh-huh. and since Merce uh, Cunningham is half Irish and half Slavic, I mm-hmm. thought it was appropriate that he make a choreography for the work. And um, finally he did. It's, it's quite, <coughs> quite a large situation because it involves um, Irish traditional musicians playing not together, but in circus. Each one... Uh, plays about 20 minutes of solos spaced wherever he wishes in the hour of the composition. Look, my tape recorder's also sick. It's only going out of one channel. Do you have one that's like this? Well, that's all right. It sounds a little bit bigger. It's a little bit, that's right. Yours has the two little things on the side. It's sounding. Right. Yours is a later version. No, just as long as I can pick. And I know that you knew Yoko uh, a long time ago from here in the um, in the '60s, or actually uh, probably before that. I don't know when you knew. Yeah, you probably met Yoko here when, he, when she went out with uh, Toshi, when she was married. She was still him. married to Toshi. Yeah. So. And I was at Wesleyan University in in, uh, in the Center for Advanced Studies. Right. Yoko and Toshi would come up and visit me. Um, and Yoko, you know, had this kind of. Uh, uh, concert giving place where, the loft, they, where yeah where things by Lamont Young and Henry Flint and so forth were done uh-huh. pieces like Draw a Straight Line you know follow it you've heard it <laughs> you know all of it <laughs> it was conceptual art so to speak to begin the fluxes. wasn't it yeah yeah right, right. and Yoko was was uh, it was quite marvelous. You'd climb all these stairs and then you'd see Yoko sitting at the table ready to take the money for the tickets you know. And she, she was so elegant looking with that straight black hair. And this is when she was married with Toshi? Yes, she yes. Married. So did she participate? Yes, she did. She wrote her own pieces. Yes, those, those short but ones. mostly she was like, a, like the one who presented all this uh-huh. music. And I think it was like once a week, wasn't it? So I, it you was would fre- know more than I It was would. frequent. Was it? And, and it was very much, it, it excited a great deal of interest. Uh-huh. Not a not among a huge audience, but, but uh, a very select audience. And people would come from great distances to, to go to one of those concerts. So it was open to the public, too? Oh, I, right. I got a more of an idea, that, at least from Lamont, I that had an idea. That it was invitational? Well, not that it was invitational, but it was mostly friends coming it, over. It was, but there were people who were not friends, who also came, who were, who were really interested in experimental music or what you call avant-garde. Yeah. I think it was marvelous. What, do you, what did you think about meeting someone, let's say like Ryan Eno, when you did that musician article? Did you, have you ever heard his music or do you? I'd heard a record. Which record? But when I, when I, the one about the air, air uh, port. Oh yeah. You know. Yeah. Music it, from the airport. It, it has, a, it's characterized by a kind of music that uh, recurs after separated by silences. Mm-hmm. Isn't that true? That's right. And the, the funny thing is that the, the same music comes back after the, each silence, or more or less the same. Yeah, that's right. Isn't that true? Mm-hmm. His work probably, I don't, I know very little about it, but yeah. his work probably um, uses, um, you know, takes a good advantage of, of changes in technology. Oh, yeah. I think a lot of music yeah. today has uh, so Particularly, I, I think the, the, the greatest one in that connection, or the most brilliant, I'm giving the indications of magic and so forth, yeah. is Laurie Anderson. Yeah. Don't you think oh, so? Oh, yeah. Well, she uses wonderful text, too. Yes, and she, and she's so full of surprises. Yeah. And it's like uh, you pull ducks 
are birds out, out of hats and out of the air, you know, yeah. don't you think? Yeah. Now, remember <laughs> when I took you out, though, a long time ago, and we went to go to Roulette, and you heard this man named Fred Frith, because he was playing with Joel and the Anta. Yeah. And remember, he was very interested in improvisation. What do you think of improvisation, like that type of music? A lot of people here in New York, like John Zorn, are doing improvisation. I, well, I'm much more interested in improvisation than I was years ago. Uh -huh. I used to have a chip on my shoulder against improvisation. And the reason I had it was because so many people who improvise, improvise the same way each time they improvise, because it's based on their taste and on their memory. Wow. I've, I've developed various ways now of improvising, not myself, right. but, or, but of getting other people to improvise, um, that, that separates them from, from, the, from that taste and memory deal. Uh -huh. I like, uh, well, you know that I like things that are beyond our control. And I like those shells that, that I put water in, and when we tip them, they, they gurgle. But they don't gurgle when you want them to. They gurgle when they want them to. <laughs> yeah, that's beyond your control. Uh -huh. that is the 